everybody, and welcome to week one of our World History Together. We're going to talk about early humans and their prehistoric civilizations and how we went from essentially nomadic hunter-gatherers to large, successful, settled, hierarchical societies. The so-called Stone Age is divided into three rough periods that uh, correlate roughly with human technological advancements. Uh, and they also sort of match with our evolutionary scale at the same time as well. So we have the Paleolithic or the Old Stone Age, the Mesolithic or the Middle Stone Age, and the Neolithic or New Stone Age. Uh, these different ages are broken up uh, in differently in different regions of the earth. And it all depends on the level of technology that is used by the societies. And it doesn't completely fit perfectly. For example, the Aztec civilization used a lot of weapons that basically used Stone Age technology, but that was the 15th century of the current era. So does it really count as Stone Age or prehistoric? Not really, because they had also advanced metalworking for gold, silver, jewels, uh, and other implements. They just didn't use iron or similar work metals or everyday metals for tool making. So this is kind of a nebulous concept. Nonetheless, it is used to divide the early periods of human history. Now, Homo sapiens sapiens, or modern humans, or the so-called wise humans, that's what sapien means, uh, are contemporaries to a evolutionary cousin, the Neanderthals. Uh, the Neanderthals were a little bit stockier, a little bit more muscular, a little bit more slope-headed. Now, initially, it was believed that hu modern humans just basically replaced these Neanderthals, but recent findings have found that humans not only competed with them, but they also interbred with them. In fact, a lot of DNA testing you can do now can reveal the percentages of your DNA that actually are Neanderthal DNA. Uh, most Eurasian, uh, people of Eurasian descent have Neanderthal DNA. And we must stop here for just a moment and talk about evolution. Now, evolution is a very messy, often polyphasic event that happens over a long period of time. And it allows to connect two seemingly disparate species with each other, or even animals with each other. For example, a field mouse could be connected to a rabbit. And the rabbit is connected to the field mouse by this line, these lines of ancestors that have similar DNA and similar uh, traits to both the rabbit and the mouse, but at some point they diverged. The same is true about human beings. We have ancestors that go all the way back and we have evolutionary cousins as well, as you can see with this tree. There are those who are not direct antecedents to us, but rather kind of parallel evolutionary schemes that for one reason or another, are not dominant. Uh, it may, in fact, be that humans interbred throughout all of their history, and that's why we have some of these divergence. But all we know right now is there is one human species left. So I guess we are on the brink of extinction. The belief that humans come directly from apes is an oversimplification of evolutionary theory and one used to propagate ignorance and, and basically utilizing in a very, um, in a very um, narcissistic or maybe even uh, uh, ignorant way, uh, biblical passage or even religious text passage that says that humans were created full form as is uh, no warranty needed, no evolutionary uh, traits needed, and is used to ignore science. And then, of course, that is used to further divide uh, faithful people from science, when in reality, science and faith are not mutually exclusive. It's entirely possible that the world that the humans from 150, 200,000, 250,000 years ago uh, would not have been suitable for the human beings that we are today with our very relatively light hair, uh, or I should say very t uh, relatively sparse hair comparatively, uh, and maybe even smaller brain capacity allowed us to save energy 
uh, in those ice ages or times of famine. So now we have humans that eventually evolved. Maybe, perhaps, this was part of a plan. Uh, if God is omniscient, why couldn't he plan um, better versions? Think about the Apple iPod. When it first came out, everybody loved that. Now, how many people use the Apple iPod? But it is an evolutionary cousin to the iPhone, is it not? And now what version of iPhone are we on? If that's not intelligent planning, what is? So back to the Neolithic and Paleolithic periods. A uh, Paleolithic period would not have had modern humans in it. Uh, in fact, the modern humans evolved during the Neolithic period. Uh, and during the Paleolithic period, humans were largely food consumers. We, the humans that lived then gathered the calories necessary to survive and to propagate the species through hunting and gathering, essentially roaming the area, uh, killing what they could, digging up what they could, eating what they could, finding whatever food, whatever way. And it was extremely time consuming. Uh, you've got to imagine if you have no grocery stores, no farms, uh, no reliable place to find food and you have to forage for it, uh, that's a lot of your time that is taken up looking for it. And the use of tools was relatively simple. Of course, they were used for hunting, so stone tools were used for hunting, things like spear tips. But they were also used for war because competition for resources created uh, relatively small clusters or clans or tribes of people uh, that would often compete for the same so, uh, same resources. So eventually hunting gave way to warfare. Uh, some clothing begins to emerge in this period, so usually uh, some kind of woven grass, uh, occasionally the use of animal furs and, and uh, proto leathers and that sort of thing. We also have the beginnings of mystical beliefs. Uh, we know this because of various cave paintings and dyes that were used on the interiors of, uh, of shelters that were used by early proto-humans. Then we have the Neolithic period. The Neolithic period is actually very revolutionary. In fact, it's, it's one of the great revolutions of human society and human uh, evolution, uh, is when humans make the transition from being food gatherers to food creators or food producers in general. Uh, during, or actually between the periods of the Paleolithic and the Neolithic period, uh, humans begin to domesticate some animals. For example, dogs are domesticated in the Mesolithic period. Uh, dogs, are or dogs are used to help hunt, guard, uh, act as companions, that sort of thing. It's one of these great symbiotic relationships. And in fact, within a few generations, uh, uh, wild dogs and their wolf counterparts uh, begin to show uh, dramatic signs uh, of change as... Uh, certain traits are bred for. So being uh, not scared of humans is an important trait. Uh, most wolves are scared, individual wolves are scared of humans. Uh, they will either attack or run away. Uh, most dogs in general are either, you know, guarding against humans to protect their human clan, or they're very friendly uh, to humans and, and strangers. So that's a, that's a trait we've actually bred for. Again, part of our intelligent design to help guide evolution. In Neolithic period, we also have the domestication of other animals, things like uh, goats, chickens, pigs, sheep. Uh, eventually, we do get to uh, oxen and horses, but that's a relatively recent compared to, uh, to other food animals. We also have the evolution of more complex tools used for harvesting, cultivation, for cutting stone, for creating shelters, and that sort of thing. We also have to the emergence of more defined mystical beliefs. So you have the emergence of this concept of gods and maybe even pantheons and even complex uh, religious belief systems, uh, origin stories of the human species, uh, because nobody wants to think that they're just kind of plunked down in the middle of somewhere. They have to have come from somewhere. Uh, and also we get the emergence of specialized roles. As you'll see in some of the additional resources that I have for this week, humans' decision to settle down and start growing food from seeds allows for a lot more food to be produced, which frees up 
some people. And you so you get these specialized roles, or what we can more broadly define as systems. Uh, in other words, it is an approach or a solution to a problem that confronts you. For example, we have a lot of people that we need to feed. So what's your first instinct? Well, your first instinct, perhaps in a post-apocalyptic, uh, I don't know, Walking Dead-ish kind of world might be to hunt down and scavenge for food. But that doesn't last very long. And in fact, scavenging for food for a long period of time uh, has diminishing returns. You may find abundant food at the beginning, but then as the resources deplete, they're not being replaced. And so there becomes fiercer competition for those limited resources. Nobody's out there making canned peaches anymore. So you've got to find a way to produce this food. So then you settle down and you start having uh, farming, but you're not going to have everybody farm. That just seems kind of silly. Uh, first of all, you're creating more food than you're actually consuming. So you're going to have a surplus. So you don't need everybody to work. Plus you need somebody to you know, guard the area that you're farming. You need somebody who's going to build shelters, somebody who's going to mend wounds or broken bones. You're going to need somebody who's going to be a leader. Uh, and if they're making decisions about the direction that the settlement is taking, they don't have time to go and farm. And so that food supports these other people. So that's a, an example of a system. There is a problem. You need food. A solution is, or a system is, to grow your own food. Well, that solution also comes with its own side problems. And we'll see that as we move on. So some human groups do settle down and begin to grow crops before about 4000 BCE. Uh, that This date has been kind of pushed back to about 6000 to maybe even 8000 BCE. And typically humans settle down near water sources. Uh, lakes and rivers are preferable, oceans a little bit less so. And you can imagine why lakes and rivers are preferable. Fresh water. Humans need fresh water. The animals that we've domesticated need fresh water. Crops, things that we're growing, they also need fresh water. So how would you, as an early human settler, want to found your community near a river or a lake? It's a perfect sense, doesn't it? You don't want to have to walk for a really long time and maybe have a scarce source of water. Now, why would you settle near an ocean? Well, maybe you don't have a lot of rivers or lakes nearby. However, the ocean does provide a bounty of food. Uh, everything from seaweed and mollusks and uh, shells that may have been washed up to actual fishing out in the ocean. Agricultural products uh, have their uses, but not the uses that we assume that they might have had in prehistoric times. A good example would be uh, the uh, theoretical jump of creating plants uh, growing wheat or growing barley or growing rye in order to make bread. The reality is bread is a very finicky product. It is a very difficult product to make. Uh, most likely foods started off as a kind of porridge where you would take the seeds, you would soak them, maybe heat them up a little bit, throw some uh, herbs in there or maybe some something pungent like shallots or garlic or whatever like that some salt and you have like kind of a, a like a really savory oatmeal or maybe in most cases as seems to be bearing true for most societies you create fermented products so you harvest uh, apples or you harvest uh, wild wheat berries or something like that, you grind them up and begin a process of fermentation where wild yeast that is present in the atmosphere begins to break down those sugars and turn it into alcohol. Alcohol has a couple of effects that are really beneficial to human beings. Uh, first, it is an analgesic. It reduces swelling. So you can imagine if you're doing some very intensive labor that you start feeling achy and, and your 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 body hurts. Uh, drinking alcohol relieves that effect. It's also an analgesic. It, it relieves pain, which again, kind of nice. And also kind of makes you feel a little tipsy. It makes you feel a little dizzy. It makes you feel a little happier. You are a little bit more intoxicated. And that's another reason. In fact, wild animals will still go out and, and find 
uh, fruit that has fallen off of trees and eat that specifically. Everything from squirrels to tree shrews to primates uh, find ways to get drunk or to get high. Uh, because it's fun, you know, why not? Now, there is also a new emerging theory that humans settled not to grow food for themselves initially, but to grow food for their domesticated animals, and that eating that food just became kind of a byproduct. Perhaps the animals didn't reproduce as much, or maybe uh, they didn't have as much control over the animals uh, in some settled societies as in others, so maybe that initially what was grown as fodder or animal feed went to f went to feed humans and we do see an um, a little bit of confirmation of that uh, with the growing and consummation of uh, oats uh, particularly in Scotland Scotland was initially growing oats to feed their highland cattle uh, but the poor people who tended the cattle couldn't afford to eat the cattle because they didn't own it usually it was chieftains or somebody more powerful than them and so with the prospect of starving uh they decided to start eating some of this fodder for themselves some of this oats for themselves and so you get the emergence of humans eating grains uh, so that may have also been playing a factor in human beings settled down settling down and growing food Regardless of what happens and why it happens, um, change does come to human societies. But historically, unlike my earlier iPhone example, change has historically been really, really slow, almost imperceptibly slow. For example, hunter-gatherers may have settled in certain fertile valleys near fresh water sources uh, in these abundant areas in order to stay near their crops, but supplemented their food intake with continuations of uh, going out in the forest and finding wild nuts, berries, mushrooms, you name it, uh, or even hunting animals that came through either uh, seasonally, such as birds like geese, or maybe just uh, just roaming themselves like deer might have. Observation of the natural world leads to improvements. So the domestication of animals and the agricultural improvement. Uh, for example, you find out just planting a seed is not enough. Maybe you have to till the soil. You have to go out and weed. You have to look out for parasites and insects and things like that that might harm your crop. So you've got to learn these techniques as time goes on. And that takes time. Settled societies do become increasingly specialized. In other words, they have more complex systems in place as new needs arises and as surplus allows for that specialization. Uh, you'll see in the example that I have, and we'll talk about this in a little bit uh, with the activities that we have next week, that a settled society doesn't mean your problems go away. It means there's new problems that arise. For example, if you have uh, a bunch of people living in one place and not moving around and they're eating, what happens after you eat, say, maybe the next day? Or if you eat something that doesn't agree with you? If you have maybe five people living in a valley, eh, it's probably you can you can probably deal with that. But what if you have 500 or what if you have 5,000 or if you have a big settlement and have 50,000 people, maybe a large city, how do you deal with 50,000 people having to go to the bathroom every single day, sometimes multiple times in a day? So you get these specialization roles and these problems that crop up that require things like the formations of government, uh, the advancement of spiritual or medical practices, uh, the in increasing in proficiency in crafts, making baskets or uh, chairs or tubs to put water or jars to put liquid in or whatever. Uh, and also the uh, more complex methods of making war, being more strategic and tactical in your thinking rather than just running at your enemy or maybe uh, having skirmishes. Technology, it has to be said, is inherently iterative. In other words, you have uh, versions of technology that aren't radical departures from the previous ones. Again, the example of the Apple iPhone 
comes into mind. Slightly better camera, slightly better coverage, slightly more memory, that sort of thing. Uh, it's not radical departures. You don't go from having, say, a 1990s massive brick cell phone to having the smartphone in your pocket in the matter of in a matter of a year or even five years. Uh, it takes time, and so. Uh, the same is true with human tools in the Paleolithic and, uh, I'm sorry, in the Neolithic and uh, agricultural revolutional periods. So you start with a natural resource, say a stick or some rocks, and you use those to make a rough tool. That rough tool does some pretty good jobs, but it could be a little bit more efficient. So create other tools to make those better tools. So now instead of having a, uh, a a rock on the end of a stick, maybe you sharpen that rock and now you have a better tool. And then maybe instead of a rock, you use copper or bronze. You have an improved tool. So those take time and they take innovation, they take thought, and they take free time that you uh, that is made possible through specialization. Experimentation also plays a role in this accidental discovery takes a role in all of this and so we get these new materials and new ideas and new opportunities that emerge uh, in the neolithic period again it is because it's the stone age a lot of the found material like uh, flint or um, granite or things like that are easily found they're relatively plentiful in fact you could probably go in your backyard right now and find a relatively suitable stone that would be a competent cutting tool if you if you worked it a little bit uh, but then eventually you get copper and that's a little bit more difficult to get at there are some surface copper uh, that can be found or surface iron that can be found or surface tin that can be found that those can be worked uh, this is a departure because unlike stone when you break something that's copper you can just remelt the copper and uh, and try again. If you break stone, ugh, you got to start all over again. And then, the, of course, copper gives way to bronze. Bronze gives way to iron. And that's what I mean by iterative, these kind of versions. You start with a natural resource, work on a rough tool, a better tool, an improved tool. So I want you to think about what are the benefits of transitioning to new materials? But also, what disadvantages are there for these new materials? Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, God, I'd rather have a iron axe than a stone axe anytime, right? But think about the skill that's needed to make a stone axe versus the skill that's needed to make an iron axe. Where does the iron come from? How do you process it? You need to melt it. You need to remove impurities. You need to cast it, forge it, craft a weapon. So it's a much more complex answer, a lot more expensive of an answer, even though it is a better answer. One of the challenges that uh, historians and archaeologists have faced is this concept of uh, timelines. Uh, a lot of a lot of students of history and of archaeology believe that these timelines are, are fixed, uh, much like the modern period has very fixed timelines. Uh, for example, 1776, that's a very fixed time. It wasn't uh, sometime in the 18th century America uh, revolted against British rule, right? It was 1776. That was the Declaration of Independence. The war started in 1775 and so on and so forth, right? In prehistory, uh, those dates are really kind of malleable. They move around a lot or they're able to be fudged. And one of the things that helped us change our viewpoint was this man in the lower right hand corner. He was a 46 year old man who was discovered in 1991. Uh, he was so well preserved in the Alps, uh, the European Alps, that he was believed to have been a recent murder victim, no more than 100 years old. Turns out uh, he was a titch older than that, uh, closer to 5,300 old, uh, years old. Uh, and he pushed back what we believed was the late, pa uh, late Neolithic, it should not say Paleolithic, the late Neolithic and early Copper and Bronze Age. Uh, this man, his name was, we, we nicknamed him Otzi, had an array of items on him that kind of push the boundaries of what we understood technology to be. 
It used to be that uh, historians taught that around 3000 BCE, in these big super specialized societies, copper was just beginning to become used as a material. But Otzi had died 300 years before then, and he had on him a copper axe. He also had stone arrows, however. They were probably used for hunting as well as protection. He was clad in a goat with goatskin boots and nice grass cloak for insulation, something to keep him nice and warm. And all over his body, he had these strange tattoos that initially were thought to be tribal decorations, but actually turn out to be early medicine, a kind of forerunner to acupuncture. He also had a pouch on him that we initially thought was, well, his snacks for later. But the type of foods that he had in there were not very nutritious. They were, however, very medicinal. So Otzi was dealing with many ailments. Uh, he was a relatively young man by modern standards at 46 years old, but he was an old man by the um, late Neolithic, early Copper Age uh, metric. He was dealing with arthritis. His joints were badly deteriorated from a lifetime of hard living. Uh, he had to do everything. There was nothing to transport him from point A to point B. So he had to do a lot of walking, a lot of hunting, a lot of crouching, a lot of perhaps even fighting. He also was riddled with parasites and he had Lyme disease, a tick-borne uh, disease. Uh, he treated many of these things, not just with the tattoos that you see here, which correspond to, uh, to acupuncture lines that are used for treating arthritis, but also the, the pouch that he had, all those medicinal herbs. Things like bir birch polypore fungus uh, was an antibiotic and antiparasitic to get rid of some of those parasites he had. So he knew he was sick or somebody knew he was sick and was able to treat it. The problem is, Otzi doesn't come from a classic, settled, Bronze Age Mediterranean society. He is way in the north of Italy when he dies. His uh, boots, the meat that he had in his stomach, all come from northern Italy. So it wasn't like he traveled to Egypt or Mesopotamia to get these items or to get this knowledge. So perhaps we've been underestimating our ancestors all this time. So as I mentioned before, uh, Otzi was dealing with a multitude of health issues and you'll have a link to the South Tyrol Museum that'll allow you to explore in a very real sense, Otzi's body. Uh, you can read about his diet, about his medicine, about his ailments, uh, and about how well preserved he was. In fact, little known fact, he was, 5,003, well, nearly 5,300 years old when he was found, but when they initially turned him over, he they could still tell the color of his eyes. They were a light blue, amazingly enough. What does Otzi reveal about human adaptation about the environment? What does his first aid kit found on him reveal about medical treatments way back 5,300 years ago? What did the tattoos reveal about chronic pain and the management of chronic pain in early human societies? And how does all of this change our concept of what a quote unquote caveman was? And isn't caveman kind of a pejorative? Aren't they seen as kind of stupid or, or uh, easily scared or, or uh, just dumb, aren't they? And yet, Without their innovations, we wouldn't be here today. So how did humans discover these medicines and maybe even these metals? Well, we're not really 100% sure. Uh, there may have been an aspect of shamanism. Uh, in other words, these, uh, these people who spoke for the spiritual needs of the populace, uh, who inter acted as intercessionaries in pleasing spirits or making curses go away or breaking spells or that sort of thing, uh, as well as uh, acting as intermediaries between ancestors who had died uh, in a practice that is still happening today called ancestor worship. Every time you drive by a graveyard, realize that we are still, in some aspects, worshiping our ancestors. The tombstones aren't there for the dead people, they're there for somebody else. 
So offering of unusual fines uh, may be part of shamanistic traditions, may be part of ancestor worship, uh, particularly if you throw them into bonfires uh, to to send them up to the heavens, to send them up to the spirits or the uh, or the departed ancestors. And that may have allowed us to reveal uh, metals, uh, early metals, uh, particularly copper, which has a relatively low melting point. So that was a, a kind of accidental discovery. Uh, in many of the same ways that medicine may have been accidentally discovered. Uh, maybe it's not very tasty, it's very bitter, it's it's not very nutritious, leaves you hungry, but somehow you feel a little bit better and maybe you're not as sick. So the omnivorous humans would have found relief from parasites and infections after eating certain foods. Uh, this is kind of corroborated in other primates. Uh, for example, there are uh, lemurs in Madagascar, which are a distant primate cousin to us, uh, who will hunt down centipedes and chew their heads off and rub uh, the venom uh, from the heads uh, upon their posterior uh, to get rid of certain types of parasites. Uh, and it seems to work. Works well for those, uh, for those primates, so why wouldn't it work well for us? So from those, uh, from these practices and from this accidental discovery, we get experimentation and adaptation. Uh, once a discovery is made, very rarely is it un unlearned, uh, almost never is it unlearned, though it may be superseded by later discoveries. Uh, for example, you and I may not know how to, oh, I don't know, uh, shoe a horse, right? But we might understand how to change a tire if we get a flat tire. So. It's not really that the technology is lost, it's just kind of superseded. Agriculture uh, allows society, human societies to become relatively successful. Settled societies start off invariably as small settlements. Uh, they expand as more humans are capable of being supported by agriculture into villages and towns. Those towns eventually develop into cities with tens of thousands of people living in them. And sometimes those cities become either city-states, in other words, big metro metropolitan areas that are control of a wide swath of territory that you find in Mesopotamia and in Greece uh, and in some areas as well, uh, or even kingdoms like you have in Egypt, uh, in Rome and uh, China and other places as well. Now, not everybody settles down. And in fact, uh, humans remain uh, largely nomadic uh, for a very long time. Uh, the majority of humans on the planet stay nomadic throughout the Paleolithic period, even though there are so societies that are settling down along the Indus Valley or Nile Valley or uh, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Some agricultural societies begin to meet and interact with other societies, as well as other settled societies they might interact with nomadists or pastoralists, uh, people who herd, follow herd. Uh, nomads might hunt, uh, might be uh, mounted or not mounted uh, and hunt animals as they follow their migratory paths. Pastoralists, again, might be mounted or not mounted and have herds of animals that they haven't settled down with. Uh, the Bedouin of Arabia are a perfect example of pastoralists. They move from pasture to pasture, keeping their uh, animals fed. And then, of course, other agricultural societies as well. This leads to a, a wide variety of interactions, including uh, competition with each other, maybe rivalries you can think about, uh, trade, which is always good. Uh, perhaps they one society has more of one resource than another does, and so they trade for these valuable resources. And of course, inevitably, warfare or conquest are some of the ways that those societies interact. Not only do nomads, uh, 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 are they sometimes subjugated, but in turn, they do their own subjugation occasionally. And we'll see that crop up time and again throughout our text. Now, why are, uh, why are certain resources important? Well, you've got to think about the way that human societies settled. And it's always about location, location, location. The successful societies are ones that have relatively mild climates, that have lots of access to resources, and have a lot of water. 
uh, for example, the early settlements along the Indus Valley and along the Ganges with relatively uh, a strong settlement in cooler areas uh, of India, for example, in the north. And you can see by comparison in the south, there's relatively few uh, because agriculture is more difficult the warmer it gets. Uh, the Fertile Crescent was called the Fertile Crescent because it was not unlike uh, the Ohio River Valley. It was relatively green, relatively easy sand. Uh, I'm sorry, not easy sand, relatively easy soil to, uh, to till. Uh, it only later becomes sandy because humans over uh, work the land. And that is one of the problems that arises from that complex system. So you want to have water, resources, and hopefully some kind of native animals that you can either domesticate or hunt or something like that. Some of the earliest settled societies are ones that you may not have heard of. And, and we'll talk about uh, the Bronze Age next week when we talk about uh, bronze settled societies. But I wanted to touch on the Harapan and the Shang Dynasty. The Harapan settle in the Indus Valley uh, in what is now modern day Pakistan. And it's one of the earliest known settled societies having cropped up about 8,000 years ago. Uh, we don't know much about them. We do know that they were extremely successful. They had very large, well-organized cities, uh, but we're not sure if they what their political organization was. Were they a kingdom? Were they city-states? It's really hard to tell. We do know they had a wide trade network because some of the artifacts that are left over uh, appear both in Mesopotamia as well as Mesopotamian artifacts appearing in the Indus Valley. They were, however, vulnerable to outside forces. Uh, they seem to be relatively peaceful society, a relatively peaceful settled society, perhaps because they hadn't come in, into contact with too many others, maybe. Or maybe it was just a particularly good period. Nobody really had very many wants. Uh, there's no evidence of armies or even warfare that happens to afflict them. Uh, they do, however, disappear from the map, uh, maybe due to... Uh, atmospheric changes, environmental changes, shifting of rivers, shifting of trade routes, we honestly don't know. Similarly, we have the Shang Dynasty. The Shang Dynasty is a slightly later adopter of agriculture, sometime uh, around 6000 BCE. Uh, and they were a city state, set of city states in a loose association, what we might call a confederacy. In other words, they were kind of cooperating with each other uh, as well as kind of squabbling. And they settled along the uh, Yellow River, a very fertile river, which itself can be dangerous. The, the Yellow River is often referred to as the scourge of China because its flooding is unpredictable and sometimes very violent. Again, the Shang Dynasty was also vulnerable to outside and internal forces. There was evidence of a civil war and some evidence of invasion. So that's how we know uh, they may have disappeared. Now, not all societies settle down. There are a lot of societies that remain relatively nomadic. Uh, the reasons for this are extremely complex. Uh, they have to do with environmental factors, access to certain resources, as well as kind of cultural re resistance. Uh, ad adap uh, adaptation of new technology is kind of a fetish for modern society. Uh, it's a very, very much a 20th Eh, 19th century and beyond thing. Uh, before the 19th century, most societies were really kind of um, leery of innovations, of radical innovations at least. Uh, and so there might have been some cultural resistance to settling down. That's why maybe European societies didn't settle down until much later, or uh, uh, Central Asian societies didn't settle down, or Southeast Asian societies didn't settle down for much later, uh, comparatively to uh, the big river valleys. Uh, they also may have occupied relatively difficult or marginal lands. Uh, there's some extreme examples like the Berbers of North Africa or the Bedouins of Arabia. But also Europe was relatively difficult to, uh, to settle down for agriculture. The, the soil was a bit tougher. Uh, there were a lot more thick forests, uh, so big deciduous trees that lasted forever and put wide roots down. And, uh, and the early stone and copper 
uh, tools that were used for agriculture were not adequate to to really settle in those areas. It wouldn't come until later, the, the late Bronze Age uh, and early um, Iron Age, that these new tools would make it possible uh, for Europeans to really settle uh, agriculturally in in uh, in Europe. Uh, same with parts of uh, China, Southeast Asia, uh, but also we have like uh, even outside of deserts and and thick forested areas you have other relatively difficult places to settle the central plains of the united states the steppes of mongolia and russia uh, the plains uh, of um, eastern europe and iran uh, so you have a lot of different factors that play into this and you get the emergence of 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 different groups and unfortunately a lot of times these these nomadic groups are referred to in very derogatory terms when written about by their contemporaries once writing is uh, invented around 4000 bce and that presents a challenge to us prior to the 20th century most archaeologists and historians believed that uh, nomads were like kind of a throwback that they were they were ignorant and they were primitive and they were they were unsophisticated and that they were uh, prone to violence the kind of barbarians at the gate kind of thing um, this is largely because they didn't have cities of their own to excavate the way say the Romans or the Greeks or the the uh, the Chinese dynasties or the Egyptians had uh, they often left no written record of their own, and so we had to rely upon the stories of their contemporaries who were often their enemies. Um, now, to put things in perspective, the Romans referred to the Germans, the Germans that came from the north, as barbarians, right? And so you think of uh, maybe horned, helmeted, Viking kind of brooding uh axe wielding frothing at the mouth kind of barbarians looking to burn down civilization because because they have stuff that we don't and we hate that uh to put it in perspective the romans also referred to the greeks as barbarians they referred to the persians as barbarians they referred to the egyptians as barbarians uh largely because they were not romans so can we say that maybe the the germans of europe were really all that savage comparatively probably not especially because a lot of times these german tribes cooperated with or were allies with or even led the roman empire so where's this all coming from well sometimes written history is not accurate history you have to look at it and analyze it break it down what is their motivation what are they trying to say do they prove their point or are they just pulling stuff out of thin air as much as we denigrate the the kind of pundit talking media of today uh it is not unusual for people in the past to write books that purport to be histories but they're really not they're really just opinion pieces and that's what we're trying to avoid uh in in this history course now a good example of a barbarian who has been kind of lack of a better term redeemed is the scythians the scythians were this barbaric society written about by the romans uh about how savage they were and how uh, uh, uh formidable they were as horsemen and they were just these these unpredictable raiders but it turns out that they actually had a very vibrant culture that was based in modern day uh ukraine and parts of russia uh they did rely on herding and trading and also raiding so yes some of their uh, reputation is deserved but to be fair romans used to crucify people so who's really being barbaric here i mean nailing somebody to a tree and letting them die over the course of several days eh, it's kind of kind of a jerk move isn't it uh so you know pot tea kettle kind of thing going on the Scythians did have some really sophisticated metalwork. Uh, they were well-known archers and horsemen, and they may have been even more egalitarian than other settled societies, because it seems that women participated in warfare. Women led some Scythian tribes and Scythian clans. How do we know? Well, actually, 
a lot of the rolling hills that were discovered uh, in Ukraine and beyond in, in the plains uh, turned out to be tombs, not hills. Uh, they were built to house the honored dead of Scythia's past. For example, this woman on the very bottom there. Uh, she was garbed in royal garb. She was mummified by the extreme, uh, extreme dry environment in which she was entombed. Uh, and she had with her weapons, including the sundered shields of enemies. So she may have been a warrior queen, uh, maybe a, a tribal leader, or maybe just a really badass woman, right? So understanding ancient, especially pre-written societies are constantly evolving. We need to separate commentaries of contemporaries from archeological evidence. In other words, we're constantly refining our understanding of the past. The past is not settled. There is some homework uh, and I want you to read chapter one and use the weekly resources that I give you uh, to help fill in the narrative gaps. I've tried to uh, add a lot of videos, but also there's some digging for you to do uh, at different museums, different magazines, and that sort of thing. Quiz number one is due by Sunday at 11.59, as are most of our quizzes. The only th exception is the final, which is due on a Saturday, uh, because I have to have the scores in by Monday. So I'll be spending all day Sunday grading. Uh, if you have any problems, you can email me. I usually answer within 24 to 48 hours. If you're having a technical problem, though, you can't access email. Uh, you can't log on to Canvas. Uh, you're, you're not quite sure if you have the right software, that sort of thing. Uh, make sure you do call uh, Thomas Moore's IT department and see if they can help you out first, because I really couldn't help you out. I don't know that much about fixing your computer. All right, guys, that is it for this week. I hope you enjoy. I'll see you again next week.